such a blessing to be back home. Nothing beats being back home, but you got to get away from family once in a while. So I had to get away from you people for one week. <laughs> Let's open our Bibles to Romans 10. Romans 10. And what I wanted to do, I, I was trying to think before I left, I was actually working on this sermon because I was trying to think of, of a way that I could sort of highlight and underline and circle and uh, draw attention to the truths right there at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. If you've not been with us, we've been going through the book of Matthew. We have come to the very last section of the Sermon on the Mount, and that section is about building your life on the rock. Of course, that is Jesus Christ. And I wanted to give us a bit of a running start. What does it mean to build your life on the rock? What does genuine, true, saving faith look like? What is that initial foundation that you must lay down in terms of saving faith? And so, I thought of the passage, Romans chapter 10, a very familiar passage, verses 9 and 10. If you've been around church very much, you've heard this passage. But I thought this passage, better than many other passages, explained to us the nature of genuine faith. It's been some years since we've looked at this passage. In fact, I, I looked at my notes, and it's been uh, five or six years since we went through this part of the book of Romans. So this should be new to many of us. Let me read to you these famous verses, Paul talking about faith in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. This is the Word of God. And I want to unpack this passage for you today, but just remember what we've learned so far in Jesus' sermon, especially toward the end. Jesus is making sure that His followers, His disciples to whom He was preaching, His disciples had a genuine faith, not a synthetic or false faith, an authentic faith. It had to be a certain type of faith, not just any old faith would do. It had to be a genuine, authentic faith. Maybe we read these words we're taking for granted, but this demand here is that we not just have a generic affirmation of Jesus, not at all. In fact, Paul is affirming exactly what Jesus had. We must enter by the narrow gate. Faith in Christ is not a broad gate. We must walk down this, this hard road, this hard way. It is a way that is unpopular. It's a way that we learned a few weeks ago false, false teachers oppose False Christianity tries to hide, and they try to fake the real way when, in fact, this is the true way. And Jesus is going to give His final part of the sermon to demonstrate for us what it is, what kind of life we should have, and He uses this great illustration of, of building a house and building it on a firm foundation. But before we get to that, like I said, I wanted to talk about genuine saving faith. Listen very carefully. Saving faith is not just being intellectually convinced. It is that, but it's much more as well, isn't it? Saving faith is not just being emotionally moved. It is that, but it's so much more, isn't it? Genuine saving faith is not just church commitment or commitment to a group of people. It, it is that, but it is so much more. Saving faith, in short, is total surrender to Jesus Christ. It is a belief in Christ that alters the way you think, the way you live, the way you speak, the way you raise your children, the way you manage your finances, the way you speak with your spouse, the kind of work you do at your job. This is the kind of faith that Scripture points us to. And as we look at this passage, we're going to see this. What is authentic faith? So let's just answer that question. Number one, authentic faith is belief. 
Look at verse 9 there. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. I want you to notice there is data there. There's information there. There there are things that, that must be understood. There are things that must be believed. The truths that are delivered about Jesus are truths about what He did in history, things He accomplished, basic ideas about humanity, where we are and why we need a Savior. So what are these basic truths that these verses convey that Jesus died as an atonement for sin and God raised Him from the dead? What do these things tell us? Well, it tells us that God is holy, that, that sin must be punished. Your sin, my sin, must be punished. God is holy. He does not in order to be merciful to us, and we just sang about His mercy, in order to be, to be merciful to us, it doesn't mean He sets aside justice for the time being. It doesn't mean He just sweeps our sin under the rug as though it never happened. No, He executes perfect justice, and He executes it on none other than Jesus Himself. Now, God is holy. Man is unholy. We must be punished. We deserve punishment. Jesus provided the holiness for us. His righteousness was imputed to us when we believe we are justified. We stand before God right because of His righteousness, just as God imputes to Jesus our sin for His punishment. These are truths that a person must comprehend in order to be saved. Now, I've just given these to you in just a few sentences. It's not that complicated. It's not that deep. But I would say you have to have the mentally, mental capacity to understand these things and, and believe these things in order to be saved. I'm always a little bit wary when someone says, well, you know, I was saved when I was two years old. Now, you can't understand these things. And I, I believe, by the way, that God does not hold people accountable. I do believe there's, there is an age of accountability, not a specific age, but until we're able to reason this and understand this, God does have mercy. I think there's evidence in Scripture of that. But until you understand this, until you believe this, you cannot be saved. There there are truths, there are facts, there's there's data here to be understood about Jesus. You must believe these things. And so often we define faith not as understanding much of anything. It's sort of a positive sentiment towards Jesus as though that were enough to be saved. And honestly, I've heard pastors, they talk about believing in Jesus as, a, as though it has nothing to do with God's wrath and punishment and sin and atonement and Jesus' payment. They don't mention any of that. They don't mention repentance. They don't mention, mention brokenness. They don't mention a, a price for sin and justification as the Bible does over and over again. Instead, they focus on how much God loves you and has a plan for you. You never hear anything about God's holiness, wrath, justice, atonement, our need to be made right. I don't mention any of that. Belief is presented as simple sentimentality, warm feelings aimed toward Jesus, empty sentimentality, just feelings, no understanding, no historical facts, no truths, no doctrine, just sentiment. I was looking at those sermons that I, I preached a while back, and I remember back when I preached this sermon I read to you the lyrics of that Frank Sinatra Christmas song, and I almost didn't include it because, you know, I've given this illustration before. I try to avoid doing that, but it's too good to pass up. The the lyrics of a Frank Sinatra Christmas song, I think the Christmas song is simply called I Believe. And here's what Sinatra sings. I believe, I believe. I believe in wishing wells, but I also believe in a lot of things, things the daisy tells. I believe, I believe that a four-leaf clover brings lots of luck, lots of joy, lots of happiness. I believe those things. And when it's Christmas time, I believe in Santa Claus. Why do I believe? I guess that I believe because I believe I believe. I believe the dreams come true. If you wish for a dream by a wishing well, don't tell your wish or you'll break the spell. It may sound naive, but that's what I believe what? You believe why? Because I believe. For so many people, that's what Christianity is for them. Oh, I just believe. 
feel warmly about God? I don't really know much. I'm not big on that. Just Jesus is so nice and kind. God loves me. That's why I believe. Honestly, I think this is why many people reject Jesus Christ. Because it's presented to them as, as something that lacks any kind of knowledge, logic, history, facts, data, doctrine. And I look at this empty religion and say, I don't want any part of that mindless religion. He was the governor of Minnesota talking about Christianity being a religion for weak people. Karl Marx, it's an opiate for the masses. It's for brainless people. It's a numbing thing. It's, to, it's just this mindless, brainless nothing, just warm sentimentality. Now, the truth is, just looking at what Paul says here, our faith is based in reality. It's based in facts. It's based in history. It's based in absolute truth. It's based in doctrine. And you must believe these things, these truths, in order to be saved. You must understand and comprehend and take to your mind and your heart that God has a just wrath against us. I mentioned the atonement, our, our sin being covered and forgiven because Jesus bore that punishment. Justification, a big word, but it's a word that's used over and over in the Bible. Don't avoid it. I've been told, pastor, don't use big words. If they're in the Bible, I'll use it. Now, I'll try to define it for you. I'll try to define justification. It means being, being made right before God, standing righteous before God. How does that happen? It's the application of Jesus' righteousness upon us. And that happens when we believe, when we have faith. That righteousness is applied to us. We don't earn merit from God. We believe, and that righteousness is applied to us, and then we stand right before God. That's justification. If you're with us back in our study of Romans, we talked about that for a number of chapters. The beginning of Romans is all about justification. There's a flow of logic in the gospel, and we must believe these things. We must comprehend them, understand them, and believe them in order to be saved. Now, let me remind you, this is not to say that a person has to believe every detail of these things. None of us can do that. You'll spend a lifetime trying to understand all the nuances and beautiful details of the atonement or justification. In fact, that's essentially what Jesus is talking about, building your life on the rock. You, you, you build the foundation of this truth, and you spend the rest of your life building on this, trusting this, learning more about this, and you do it as a lifetime endeavor. But it's based on these truths. You understand why this is a narrow gate? Yes, many people reject Christ because they think it's empty sentimentality, a, a brainless religion, but many others reject Christ because they don't want to think. They just want to feel. Or they want to stick with what Mama said. They want to stick with the religion that they were taught growing up. They don't want to think about it, analyze it, criticize it, study the Word. They don't want to do this. They want to be told it's easy. Believe in Santa Claus. Believe in four-leaf clovers. Believe in wishing well. Believe in Jesus. All the same. No, it's not. This faith is a faith based on fact, truth, history, doctrine, it is a faith of genuine belief. But it's not only that, is it? Faith is not simply cold, hard facts. Maybe that's where it enters. Maybe that's where it begins in our minds with the truth, with reality, with understanding these concepts. Maybe that's the starting point, this, this mental, intellectual side of it. But that's not all faith is, is it? What else, what else is true about saving faith? Saving faith is also conviction, understanding data is not enough. Look at the text, verse 10, believe in your heart, verse 11, with the 
heart one believes and is justified. Now, this gives us this point, another component of saving faith, and it is involving conviction. We don't have to get too complicated with the language here. Paul doesn't use the word heart like we do in English today. I know it's hard to imagine that Paul doesn't use language like we do today, but the word heart in his day meant a lot more than what we mean today. When we say someone played with a lot of heart, right? I watched that poor Arizona guy try to make the touchdown last night. I cheered that he didn't. And I, uh, he played with a lot of, well, he played, he did a good job. You did notice he ran right off into the the tunnel. Well, you did a good job. You tried your best. You played with a lot of heart. For us, heart simply means a lot of emotion. For Paul, the word heart, and a lot of the biblical writers, the word heart means emotion, but a whole lot more than that. It means the center of who you are, your core being that defines everything for you. It, it is your emotion, but it's everything else. It, it's your mind, it's your will, it's your desires, it's everything. Everything that you are. In fact, the, the Bible uses this word heart interchangeably with words like soul and spirit. Not Holy Spirit, but our spirit. This is the core eternal part of who we are. It's the basis of who we are. And it is in that part, in that area of our life, where this, this information, this data moves from something that's just intellectual to something that is life-defining. It becomes not just a, an intellectual affirmation, it becomes a conviction. It's something that defines you. And faith is definitely a mind thing. Understanding is something you do with your mind. That's belief, but it's more than that. It's giving your soul to this. It's giving your heart to the truths presented in the gospel. It's becoming fully convinced of the gospel, not just in your mind, but in all of your life. You remember what it says about the Word of God in Hebrew chapter, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit. He's not trying to divide the idea of soul and spirit there. He's just saying it goes all the way down to the core of who you are. It gets beyond your mind. It gets beyond just intellectual things to your convictions. It works on the deepest level. So this deals with conviction, conviction that God is indeed holy. I remember the night that I was finally born again and then repented and trusted Christ. I remember that night as the conviction began to grow and grow and grow and I began to sweat bullets and realize that God is holy. And it wasn't just words on a page or theological information but God's holiness demanded my execution and damnation. Has that sunk into your heart? Now, Jesus said that He would send the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Maybe God's doing that through the Spirit right now to you. Finally, for the first time, maybe it's always been data and information and things you affirm in your mind, but now it's finally making its way to your heart. It's true conviction. I think if you're convicted normally, your emotions will follow. It's always amazing to me to see how God, when He changes a heart, when He goes, and the, the gospel and the truth goes from the mind to the heart, how, how people are just rocked at their core. I've had big, tough guys in my office weeping because God is convicting them. His Spirit is changing them. And I think for those of us who grew up in church, many of you grew up in church, you, you learned about the gospel, and this is me as well. Grew up around a church. You, you can't really remember a time when you didn't believe. I mean, maybe you've always sort of affirmed. Maybe there were some questions or you strayed a little while, but but you've always, maybe looking back through your history, looking back through your life, you've, you've always had an affirmative view of Jesus Christ. You've always believed in the facts and the data and the theology of Jesus Christ. But the question is, has that truth been applied to your heart? Has it drilled down to the core of who you are? 
Has it gotten to the point where it, it divides your, your spirit? It, it pierces you. I believe it was Peter that was preaching not long after Pentecost. And it says they were spurred or they were pierced in their hearts. It, it went beyond belief. It went beyond facts to the changing of your heart. There is conviction involved. Have you been convicted? Have you come to the point of true conviction of your sin, of what you deserve? Have you fully been convinced of who Christ is and what He's accomplished on your behalf? Are these truths foundational for who you are? Are they at the very core of your identity, of your decision-making? Paul makes this clear. This is not just about facts and figures. It's not just about belief. It's also about conviction. Now, what about the evidence of belief and conviction? Genuine faith flows and covers not just belief and not just conviction, but it covers one other aspect, and that is repentance. That's number three. Look at our verses again. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You see this? Genuine faith moves from your mind to your heart and then to your actions, your profession, or to use Paul's words here, your confession. It starts with the mouth, but then it evidences itself in your activity, a transformed life, Paul will go on to talk about in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This is why when Jesus explains the gospel, He doesn't say, in order to be my disciple, just believe a few facts, feel really deeply about them, and you're clear. You're in the clear. In order to be my, my disciple, you have to have a great amount of emotion. Just feel something warmly toward me, and you'll be okay. No, what does Jesus say? And If anyone wishes to be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. There is an activity. We highlighted this in the book of James. There is an activity that is commensurate, that goes along with genuine faith. It is truly life-changing. Repentance is a life commitment on that truth of Christ that is foundational to how you act, to how you talk, how you live. James chapter 2, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that kind of faith save him? The answer is no. Genuine faith is always evidenced with repentance. I will show you my faith by my works. We heard this a moment ago. We're not saved by works. That's clearly established in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 2, Colossians 2. However, it does say later on in Ephesians 2, verse 10, we are saved for good works. There is a, an evidence of genuine faith. You openly confess with your life what is true about your heart and about your mind, the kind of faith you have. That's why, over and over, the summary of the gospel, as the Bible gives it, is repent. The summary of the word, summary word for what Jesus preached was repent. Repent and believe the gospel. That's essentially a summary of faith. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 17, we are a new creation. And old things, that's old habits, old language, old attitudes... Old things are put away. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer who I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So I live my life in light of what Christ has accomplished for me. Every decision I make, everything I do, is tainted by this foundational truth. He gave himself up for me. Jesus says in John 17, 6, the sign of a true believer is that they keep God's Word. 1 John 2, 3, by this we know that we've come to know Him if we keep His commandments. 
And yet, in spite of all the evidence of repentance being a part of genuine faith, there are many people who believe that a person can be saved and go to heaven without ever having any kind of repentance whatsoever. Change life, a new profession, not a new job, but a new profession in terms of the way they live, the way they speak of Christ, the way they act. This is part and parcel, parcel to a genuine faith. Let me suggest a few reasons why we struggle with this, and then we'll wrap things up. We struggle with the idea of a repentant faith. This is, this is patently obvious, especially, I think, in the American church. I, th- I think it's, it's very obvious here in Hawaii. I've been here for almost a decade, and there has, even in the time that I've been here, a lot of people profess Christ. In the last 30 years, there's been a revival in, in terms of people professing Christ, but the latest statistics show only about 4% of people living here are genuine evangelical believers. It's still a very low amount. Why is that? Why do you have all these people, 50% I think or more, who claim Christ but don't live like Christ? What's taught them? Why can they feel like they can live a life? Why maybe do you feel like you can live a life, the life you've always wanted, no repentance, only something in your mind, and maybe you've convinced yourself it's in your heart as well? I think there's a few reasons. One, I just don't think it's found in much preaching anymore. The idea of repentance is avoided. It's not popular. It doesn't fill churches. It doesn't draw the crowds. People don't flock to sermons on repentance. Church is a business proposition. If you do anything, you've got to gather the crowd, so avoid preaching repentance. What you preach, instead of repentance and self-denial, what you preach is all the stuff that people want to hear. Jesus loves you, has a plan for you. So you focus on those things. Those things are true, but they're not true without the rest of the gospel. And so people grow up learning about Jesus' love, learning about all the wonderful, positive things about Jesus, but they never learn about this part of faith, this necessary element of faith, the idea of repentance and profession. Another reason I think we've replaced biblical words and biblical language about salvation with unbiblical language about salvation. Let me give you a couple of examples. For years, whenever I was talking to someone about the gospel, I would tell them, all you need to do is ask Jesus into your heart. Now, I don't think that's necessarily a damning thing to say. I don't necessarily, I'm not saying this is all wrong. If you've ever done that, that person probably didn't really get saved. They're probably destined for hell. You've messed them up for eternity. No, I'm not saying that. But that phrase, you understand, is not in the Bible. Ask Jesus into the heart, into your heart. And no, that's not a correct interpretation of Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Ask Jesus into your heart. Paul never said it. James never said it. Jesus never said it. Jude never said it. Peter never said it. The writer of Hebrews never says it. As far as we can tell, it got popular in the 1970s. It was when the children's ministry movement began to... And before, some of you are old enough to know this... Years ago, churches didn't have youth ministry and children's ministry. It was all just sort of one thing. You did church. And uh, as uh, time went on, they started to sort of populate. We've got to have a children's ministry. We've got to have this ministry. And as children's ministry got popular in the 1970s, this phrase sort of started popping up as a way to explain the gospel to young children. Just ask Jesus into your heart. Again, I don't think that's necessarily altogether wrong, but it's not necessarily biblical. And it certainly doesn't say anything about repentance, a changed life, a total surrender. It's just talking about something very positive. Who doesn't want to ask Jesus into their heart? I want Jesus in my heart. Don't you want Jesus in your heart? Of course you do. Go to heaven if you have Jesus in your heart. Just ask him. He's there. Not a biblical phrase. Another example, I think, of an unbiblical ideal is what we call the sinner's prayer. Again, let me say I believe that sinners 
pray a prayer of, of repentance and even crying out to God for mercy is a prayer of sorts. And we ought to encourage people, especially when we evangelize, for them to cry out to God. I do it every Sunday. I tell those of you who are not born again, who are not saved, if, the, if God is moving you and changing your heart to cry out to Him, to beg for mercy, to surrender everything and repent. So I think in a sense that is true. That is a sinner's prayer. But I think in a lot of cases this has been taken to an unhealthy area where if you just repeat this mantra, just say these words and you're in. And some people live their life saying, well, I said those words. I repeated that prayer. And there's no repentance. There's no conviction. Maybe there's a little bit of sentimentality. Maybe there's a little bit of belief. But we've been duped by, again, using an unbiblical concept. Another reason why I think we forget that repentance is part and parcel of true faith, and I think it's very personal. I think there's some of us who have loved ones who one time said a prayer or maybe who one time asked Jesus into their heart, and they're not with God at all now. They've walked away from God. And so in order to, to soothe our fear that that loved one won't be in heaven, we say, well, you know, at least they believe. I know there's no repentance. I know that's not there. I know there's no profession. I know they don't look like they walk with God. But you know, back then, 38 years ago, they said some words. And we sort of soothe ourselves into thinking that maybe repentance is not really, it doesn't have to be, really be part of the whole equation of saving faith. The Bible doesn't teach us this. Final reason we neglect the idea of repentance, maybe it's because you yourself have not genuinely repented. Maybe you're that loved one. You said a prayer. You walked an aisle, you shook a pastor's hand, you talked to a priest, you did something, you had some sort of religious experience. You've never repented. And so I would say, repent. Trust in Christ. Beg for God's mercy. Believe. If the Lord is convicting you today, believe and repent. Paul says here, confess with your mouth. Like I said, as we studied in Romans, ultimately it's not just a profession of lips and mouth, but it's a, it's a life, a transformed life, a repentant life. Your repentance is that foundation, and you build this whole edifice, this, this, this house, which is your life, on this rock of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. For a Christian, repentance is not something you did once a long time ago to get into heaven. Repentance is a way of life. Why do we start every Sunday confessing, trusting in the cross, thanking God for His pardon? Because we believe in repentance. This is what not just unbelievers must do, but Christians continue to do their whole lives. Now, ladies and gentlemen, genuine faith, belief, conviction, repentance... This is the first step of building your life on the rock. That's what it is to enter through the narrow gate. That's what it is to, to choose the hard way, the unpopular way. But it's the way that leads to life. And so my prayer is that if there are some of you here who have never had genuine faith, that you would have that faith right now, and that all of us would be encouraged toward a more genuine faith. Let's pray that God would grant us this grace. Father, we ask for that grace, the grace of genuine faith. I pray for those of us who are believers that you would continue to work in us, continue to, to change us and mold us and make us and call us to a more and more genuine faith. Help us to, again, test our faith, to look at it carefully against the the testimony of Scripture, what Jesus says and what Paul said later as he defined for us saving faith. Lord, help us understand these things. Help us have genuine faith. Lord, we love you. 
We worship you. We ask that you'd move in us right now. And we ask for it in Jesus' name.